Hi, this is Paul, and today we're going to talk about YouTube. The medium is the message, right? This little corner, virtually not alone, all of the stuff that we're doing, much of it is centered around YouTube, except, of course, the estuary stuff, which is not on YouTube, or somewhere on YouTube, or not an estuary is on YouTube, or round, round, round we go. I was having a conversation with my sister who I think will, I'm going to do a randos conversation with my sister coming up, which should be quite interesting because when I say, tell me about the household you grew up in, I grew up in the same household. So she mentioned to me Indoor Cat. Everybody knows about Indoor Cat. Indoor Cat blew up the internet. Indoor Cat, Indoor Cat, Indoor Cat. And I thought, I didn't hear anything about it indoor cat so you know when she mentioned that i took my name to, i took the name down and then the next day i thought oh yeah my sister mentioned this one thing so i'll uh, i'll look it up and I did a little digging and up oh, i found indoor cat Twenty thousand subscribers started her youtube channel two months ago uh, One hundred seventy six thousand views in the first video and uh, falling off pretty quickly. Second video a month ago, it was a very Merry Christmas. Third video, an apartment tour, but not really. Fourth video, me before YouTube, a little origin story. So from 127,000 views to 26,000 views to 34,000 views to 15,000 views, she started a YouTube channel. And now having been on YouTube a little while, to me it's like, the algorithm liked that video for some reason. It needed that video for some reason. And so that video went to all kinds of people for some reason. And it, it was an absolutely fine video. It was a very um, nice video. Hello. And just to give you a sense of it, she starts out... Start a YouTube, please. I get it. You moved to New York. It's beautiful. You're having all these experiences... You're seeing all these amazing things. So the camera work, the photography, obviously someone else is you know, holding the camera or whatnot. And then I found this other, not that one yet, uh, not that one yet, this one. Um, okay, testing, testing, one, two, three. So here are some beautiful aesthetic photos, videos actually of my morning walk with my dog. This is how we start our videos. This is how she started her videos. Now we've got something you don't really want to see. It's a spider. I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. You might not like it. Some pictures of some ducks on a lake. Oh, hang on a minute. I've got to cue some cool music. And... Hang on. Nice trees. Wonderful. So she, this video, Algo got a, took for a ride too. It's, it's her largest video. So seven, you know, almost 8K views, all the rest of them in sort of hundreds for the most part. She's got 376 subs. Nice TLC size okay. channel. Testing. Now, of course, Indoor Cat is in New York City, so we're still 37 years old. We're still de dealing with friends. And she talks. It, it's a very well-made video. Um, it was different for everyone, but it was really nice. You know, we had this nice camaraderie. We'd all um, pile up on the couch with glasses of wine and watching The Bachelor. Or, you know... <laughs> And then she goes into her move to New York. About living with my family, and especially with the roommate situation, there were, could be petty little fights and passive aggressive stuff going on. And I think people just really wanted to move on to the next phase of their lives, you know, whether that was getting their own place, moving in with a partner, changing cities. Yeah, I definitely felt that. I wanted my own space so badly. I had all these dreams, you know, I was like, I'm gonna live alone, I'm gonna have a cat, and I'm gonna decorate the way I want, and my home is gonna be a reflection of me and my taste. It was like this big 
marker for independence and adulthood and like you've made it. You know, especially living alone in New York, I don't take that lightly. That was a big step for me. I fully support myself. Signing the dotted line on that lease was something I really prepared for. Now I have it and I had to say, once every box was unpacked, once every painting was hung on the wall, I kind of looked around and it felt really quiet and weird. It was almost like I didn't put two and two together, that living alone meant being alone. Why was this such a mystery to me? I think I wouldn't notice it so much if, if my life felt a little bit more dynamic. But something also happened where like casual hangouts with people became a little bit more elusive too. And part of that has to do with me, you know, I'm I'm an introverted person and I'm also a, just a person who's overwhelmed by the effort it takes to make plans. You know, I, I have text message threads with friends that, you know, go on and- You are a good candidate for the Virtually Not Alone Network. Do we have a network for you? It's a, it's a, it's a very nice video and she talks about many of the things that we deal with here. Now, she she did it in a well-produced way. You just look at, she's using a good camera. She does a beautiful job editing. She's really got a sense for, she's got a sense for the craft and she did a lovely job. What's interesting in many ways is what it provoked Months later, here we are, 30-something-year-old, posts a vlog, and she is just probably, like, the fastest-growing YouTube channel of 2024. It's wild. It's totally wild. I've got some notes here, because I'm obsessed, and I don't want to stuff this up. And I wrote these notes on a an envelope when I was on the treadmill a couple of days ago. If she'd get a little card and add a little branding she might really have something because i've tried to record this several times and i don't want to come across as crazy i guess after watching it and having all of these obsessive thoughts it started to go into self-doubt about myself self-doubt i started assessing every single vlog that i'd ever done i came to the realization that i probably should just give up who cares about my channel well i care about my channel so after all of the self-doubt, the self-pity, the obsessive clicking onto Indoor Cat's channel and constantly watching her growth, I came to the realization that she might be the exception. Like, do you all remember he's not, he's just not that into you? I thought maybe, maybe I'm the rule and she's the exception, maybe. Yes, you are the rule, and she is the exception. So why do we do it, and what do we want to do with it? So then, of course, when you start watching some of these categories, Algo starts divvying up more videos like this. Okay, okay, okay. We're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. So, I have decided this is the one. This is going to be the video, the very first video that I upload as a proper little promise to myself that I'm going to work on my video skills this year. Charlotte has 217 subs and this is 836 views with um, a variety of comments. So good for her. I watched the movie Vengeance. It was very interesting and if you only if you're not going to watch the movie and you just want to get a sense of the best speech in the movie, you can just go to movie clips. I'll leave a little I'll leave a note I'll leave a note down below. And well, thanks to TurboScribe, which is an A which is an AI transcription engine that uh, the um, the person who uh, there's a person in the TLC who owns this site and developed this and said, you seem to be needing transcribing. Here, let me give you an account. So I do all my transcribing with TurboScribe. Works great. So basically in this scene in the movie, the, the, contact, the plot of the movie is that 
a guy who is in New York and he's like one of these archetypal New York single dudes gets lured to tech to Texas because a woman that he had that he hooked up with uh, died of an overdose in a party in a field and her family seems to think he is super he she was super into him she had a picture of him basically the family uh, how many how many spoilers do I want to give not too many anyway he goes down to Texas that's the premise and I can I can do this fairly non spoilerish cuz I really like the movie it was a good movie and it leads to this scene where this Ashton Kutcher guy who is a very interesting character basically gives the BJ Novak guy a speech where basically gotcha I caught okay but who caught who so the Aston Kutcher guy starts talking actually uh, they're, they're all one speaker pretty much that's a story about America let me know if you need me to re-record it or, like, rephrase things. I can do that, too. What? You and I are going to be sitting on a panel about this. I wanted it to be great. We both know how this works, right? I mean, at first, everyone thinks, um, everyone's going to think you got your bad guy. No one's going to let you, no one's going to let it be that simple. Everyone's going to have their own takes. That's how it works, right? Everyone has a take. If you don't have a take, you don't have a voice right there. If you don't have a take, you don't have a voice. This is pro felicity. This is Achilles making the decision to die young instead of having a lifetime with his family. Instead, he will go and fight the Trojan War and always be remembered. And his story will be told by Paul Vanderclay on his YouTube channel. And somewhere between two and 4,000 people will see it. It's right there. Everyone has a take. And if you don't have a take, you don't have a voice. And if you don't have a voice, you don't exist. So yeah, at first, everyone's going to blame me. But then someone's going to say, wait a sec. There's a big difference between leaving somebody to die and killing someone. And now part of what this movie does is it, at one point too, it begins to get into, well, what really killed this single white woman? What really killed her? Was it a spirit? No, nobody was going to say that because that's a little TLC language. Was it a an epidemic? Was it a, was it economics? Was it sociology? What really killed her? Sure, she died of an overdose in a Texas field. But what really killed her? A take. You've got to have a take. And then you have a voice. And then you exist. Nothing. I turn to you. So what were you doing here? At first place, he asks the B.J. Novak character. What was your relationship with her? She was a hookup. Why did you exploit the grieving family? Why did you come to Texas? That On the phone, they're like, you better come down. She was so into you and, and you knew her. And why did you come down? Oh, because I want to make a podcast. The podcast is going to be great. And so as he's going, he's doing all this recording and they're feeding him and they're, you know, they're the, they're the victims of this or they're the hicks of that or those characters. I mean... That's what they're going to be, right? Famous characters, my famous characters. And then they're going to blame the, blame the family. I hope they're ready for that. They'll blame the president, the last president. And then they'll start with the conspiracy theories. And then someone will refute the conspiracy theories. And then one side will take their version like their cause. And the other side will take the other side just to take the other side. And all until your story proves the defining truth of our time, which is what? Everything means everything, so nothing, nothing means anything. 
I, I watched a couple of her videos a while ago, so I subbed it. I'm subbed to like a thousand channels. And then this video is sponsored by Squarespace, which is really hilarious because, again, the title of her video is How Liberalism Exploits the Culture War. Criticism of the concept of the culture war claims that it's manufactured by conservatives and reactionaries to benefit them in electoral politics. But little attention is given to how liberal media, liberals in general, largely benefit from it too. We tend to see contemporary liberalism as the answer to the culture war since one of the defining features of this ideology is to resist polarization and seek a middle ground. Culture wars are the product of extremism and irrational passions that can only be resolved through liberal pragmatism and empathy. Ideally, liberalism seeks to extend rights so that more and more people can take part in the democratic exchange of ideas. That's what a YouTube channel like Jubilee hopes to do. It wants to bring a variety of people to the conversation. And we hope that one day that Jubilee will become you know, the Disney for empathy. Now liberalism is what gave birth to the idea. Now, now they had a little little thing on the bottom. You know, the Disney. So so Jennifer Liu, the founder, quit her. Wait a minute. This founder quit his six-figure job to start a business. How he went from making zero to paying himself a hundred grand. CNBC 2021. Empathy in rainbow letters. For empathy. Now, liberalism is what gave birth to the idea of the social contract, which is the basis of most democracies. Philosopher Rousseau came up with this idea in the 18th century because he refused to believe that monarchs were divinely empowered to legislate. On the other hand, he believed that power belongs to the people, that democracy would ensure individual freedom. So the social contract between people and their political representatives was one way to achieve that, and that's pretty much what we have today. We elect representatives who are expected to defend our interests and our freedoms in Parliament. We agree to give them our voice, our agency, to legislate and build the society that we want. So that's the ideal of liberalism. That's what Rousseau and other philosophers of the Enlightenment had in mind. The issue, though, is that their definition of people was quite limited. People meant white middle and upper class men. It's so funny because the white middle and upper class men get, um, get sort of treatment here, but Rousseau sort of gets a pass. So if you didn't have enough money, if you were a woman, if you were not white, then you were not part of the social contract. In fact, in order to join the social contract, marginalized groups have had to convince liberals of their worthiness and faced a lot of resistance because of that. I mean, all the rights that we enjoy today, the right to vote, the right to have ownership over one's body, weren't simply acquired through dialogue, peaceful negotiations or um, debates, they are not the product of liberal systems alone, no. That's the illusion liberalism likes to tell itself. But the historical reality is that those rights have been acquired using the very methods that liberals reject. Radicalism, violence, political instability. The culture war is a great example of political instability. We hear everywhere that our society is getting more and more polarized, and the liberal answer to that is simply to listen to each other. Muslims listen to ex-Muslims, white feminists listen to POC anti-feminists, trans conservatives listen to trans liberals. That's the mission that Jubilee is on, to build connection, to share empathy between culturally different groups. And you know what? Why not? If we take the example of the white feminists versus the POC anti-feminist video, which is the video that prompted me to make this video, we see that there is an attempt from white feminists to take the perspective of the POC group as they articulate the difficulties of their lives and why they disagree with the feminist movement. We can say that the white feminists show empathy towards POC women, and we, as viewers, perceive that as a good thing. But I don't know, for me, it still looks kind of staged and fake. I feel like- Even, even though she, she basically earlier said that if you really want to have positive change, break the liberal rules with violence, etc., etc. Like maybe our understanding of what empathy is is flawed. So I decided to read more on that topic, and what I found was quite illuminating. Psychologist's interest in empathy-related phenomena hugs back to the 18th century moral philosophy. Wait, wait, moral philosophy by guess their sex, guess their skin color. Particularly David Hume and Adam Smith. 
Oh, good thing they're not middle-aged, high-status white men. Air empathy, or what was then called sympathy, was regarded to play a central role in constituting human beings as social and moral creatures, allowing us to emotionally connect to our human companions and care for their well-being. Liberals today continue to understand and use empathy for that exact purpose. But further research showed that this belief was kind of misconstrued. One philosopher in particular... Further research showed... His name is Jesse Prince even argued that empathy could lead to uh, dangerous behaviors. He talks about the fact that we tend to empathize more easily with attractive persons, that's pretty privileged. We empathize more with persons that are in close proximity and only if their suffering is particularly- Especially if the proximity is a screen. Not worthy. He also explained that empathy is easily modulated by the way we are taught to view the world, which- In other words, empathy isn't sort of Empathy isn't sort of some divine revelation. It's a feeling that's been constructed in you for a certain group. Implies a bias incompatible with the impartial stance that a moral perspective demand. Finally, a moral perspective demands an impartial stance. Heightened empathy for perceived wrongs done to members of the in-group can also lead to violent and immoral behavior. And finally, finally, Empathy tends to focus on the You know what else can lead to immoral and violent behavior? Breakfast. On rather than the many, what is referred to as the spotlight effect feature. So for example, someone might dismiss important statistical information on an epidemic because their empathy is directed at a specific video they saw of someone experiencing side effects after taking medication to prevent the spread of that epidemic. If that makes sense. Hey everybody, first I want to introduce myself and my name is Sean Skelton. All those arguments point to the fact that empathy doesn't necessarily lead to the formation of more. We need something pure, perfect, that's going to, to live, to yield the formation of moral beings that will be perfect. Moral beings like philosophers of the Enlightenment believed. We can't build a caring, morally good society with just empathy. Yet, that's what liberal media like Jubilee promote all the time. Instead, Prince believes that the moral emotions such as anger, guilt and shame are the foundation for morality. These emotions forge the basis of social justice, which leads to a more equal emotions wait a minute, such wait a minute, as anger, wait a guilt and shame. It's not like this pure empathy that we feel good what we really need if we really want moral formation is anger guilt and shame and all of those people who are making all of those videos that they left religion because the religion they left was full of anger guilt and shame all the foundation for morality these emotions forge the basis of social justice, which leads to a more equal, morally good society. Now, if a morally good society, we're back there again. If we go back to the Jubilee video, we see that the white feminist's empathy was. And basically, she winds up saying that, well, we've been bamboozled by identity politics because identity politics can be bamboozled by just sliding in someone of a particular group to say something and then by virtue of standpoint epistemology, we all must believe it. And surprised? So yeah, at first everyone's gonna blame me but then someone's going to say, wait a sec, there's a bigger difference between leaving somebody to die and killing someone. Nothing. <laughs> I. So what are you doing here, BJ Novak, making your podcast? Paul Vanderclay, making your YouTube? Um, what's your relationship with her? Why did you exploit the grieving family, those characters? I mean, that's what they're going to be, right? They're going to be characters on a screen whether it's done by empathy or it's going to be anger grief and shame <laughs> it's just amazing watching the world go round and, it, and it's easy to get nihilistic and so we watch the world go round and round and round it goes and so 
maybe I'll make a YouTube and maybe I'll be seen. And this was, this was, this was, I thought the best of the videos. Just not that into you. I thought maybe, maybe I'm the rule and she's the exception. Maybe. I have to say her YouTube videos are great. They're so well executed in her house, her style, aesthetic, the way that she edits. It is 100% authentic. Once I came to that... And she's right. If you look, I mean, she does a nice job. Um, beautiful videos. Uh, very nice. Very nice. And, and that alone will get clicks. There's no question about that. Whoops, this one. Realization, I self-assessed everything that I had done. I've done nothing but copy people's editing skills. But then I, I realized I wasn't being honest. After all these copying of these 20 something year olds, it is time for me to reassess my channel and my content. Just before Christmas, I did a little bit of experimenting with shorts and tragically, I created all of these, these shorts using TikTok filters. You know the ones, you know? What's my 2024 prediction? Where is my soulmate? Opening up the Christmas bonbons, what are you getting for Christmas? Predictive and cringeworthy. I, I gotta find these. Yeah, she did shorts. The the one the one I'm most compelled to click on, the dog, the dog, the dog. Immediately, I went straight onto my channel, and I went through all of my shorts and put the most cringeworthy ones on private. I was becoming the desperate girlfriend and I was gripping at straws trying to get people to like me and to follow me. And look, granted, at that time, I probably gained 50 subscribers through shorts, but that means I had to keep creating this content, which is just not me. I want to thank Indoor Cat. Thank you for teaching me to be honest. Now, a struggle that I have, I have about six months worth of content that I need to edit. I don't know how. This is why you don't edit. If you want to be on YouTube, don't edit much. I'm going to do it. Actually, no, I do. It comes down to the editing. It comes down to the voiceovers. It comes down to the music. It's chopping and changing and zooming and like Kat says all these magical things that you can do in creating a unique YouTube that suits my character so that I'm not a desperate girlfriend and that you end up liking me for me and my personality because I'm a good person all right do I have a network for you you know what you know what you know what you earned I am sub number 377 I don't know that I'm ever going to watch another one of your videos, but you are virtually not alone. And right as of now, you are part of the virtually not a known network right now. So there you have it. I should just say that. What's, what's her name? Uh, shoot. I don't even know her name. She made this a month ago. Event Life Australia. How am I supposed to? Oh, okay. We'll do this. Dear... Event Life Australia. Thank you for your thought provoking video. I thought it was excellent. Maybe my maybe my comment will disappear because we all know how that works on YouTube. I thought your your video was oh oh we've got we've got our AI corrector. Uh yeah, a little hyphen would make that better. I thought it was excellent. You are now a part of the virtually not alone network. See Griswold Grimm for details. Keep up the good work. Figure out how to make videos without editing 
and you'll make more. Signed, your internet pastor. Should I say that? Uh, no. There. Bingo. What's the point of all this? Hmm. What's the point of all this? I haven't had any video from Jonathan Dumier on my channel yet. Another part of the Virtually Not Alone Network. This was a really good one. It is such a drastically different experience than reality. And it might sound obvious. This sounds obvious. The internet's really different from how I live my life. Yes, it is. And when you consume it blindly, you are giving up your material body. Your body is doing nothing. Oh, I'm not doing anything. I'm just on the internet, bro. You're not. You're, you're in some bizarre, strange place. And it's vitally important to understand it. To know the rules. If you don't know the rules, you're doomed. They'd probably eat you. If you go to Olympus or to Hades and you violate some arcane law, ignorance of the law is not an excuse. Every space has laws, has natural law. You know, it operates on a certain set of principles and foundations. It's how the thing works. The internet is no different. We must be conscious in the way that we utilize these. Uh, astounding. Now, that's, I loved what he said all the way up until then, and it's like, we must be conscious as if, <laughs> that's, you know, Ian McGilchrist. But every time someone says we must be conscious, the emissary brain feels like it's seen. And I'm not saying we should just go through blindly. I'm saying we, for the most part, will because we will by no means be able to be conscious enough of everything that we are doing here and now. But here we are in this space. Here we are wanting to be seen so that we matter. Here we are in the YouTubes figuring it all out. Hmm. Leave a comment. Approaches are, that's where, that's where the alignment is between Grim and I. Okay, so what is bringing down the fourth wall project, Grim? A terrible spell. And part of that spell, the uh, humans have a campfire circuitry. Um, for whatever reason, probably because it... So, like, the television engages that. And, like, that's when your tribal elders are passing on information and stuff. So, like, those things are hijacked and make you everybody feel like they're audience. And, like, you'll... Like, if you watch characters in series that do break the fourth wall, and that's... That's what the fourth wall I'm referencing when I do it. It's the, the wall that behind which you are audience and not a human. So. Okay. Hashtag paintball for Jesus at Grim Grizz. Hashtag break the fourth wall. So like you, you do like break the fourth wall that doesn't exist and be like. Break the fourth wall a little bit. You, you, you really helped me break the fourth wall. That like, you know, it's just people. Good poetry is definitely, it's ask, it's definitely always trying to break the fourth wall. Always tried, as Grim Gris says, to break the fourth wall to the degree that I can.